Um, thanks everybody for coming. Um, this is our second breakout session of the day. Um, I'm going to take 10 seconds just to say welcome, thanks for coming, um, and introduce our panel moderator, uh, the legendary Nikki Acosta. Acosta. Acosta, excuse me. You'd think after working with her for a year, I'd figure this out by now. Um, who's, gonna, who's got a great panel? I'm going to let her introduce her panelists. And uh, just as a reminder, we are doing a drawing at the end of the, each session. So be sure to get your drawing cards. And we'll do, be doing a drawing for an iPad mini at the end of the session. And uh, with that, Nikki, I, take, I give it to you. Thank you. And I'm going to tell my teammates, if you're going to post a picture of me on Twitter or something, make sure I don't do the double chin thing, OK? <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Nikki Acosta. Are we recording in the back? We're good? Solid. Awesome. So uh, yes, it's been an interesting couple of years. I'm so excited to have some panelists today that are uh, customers of Cisco OpenStack Private Cloud. Uh, which interchangeably, I have a slide that says this, but you may hear the term MetaCloud and Cisco OpenStack Private Cloud a little bit uh, during the presentation. So before we jump into the panel, I just wanted to take a couple minutes and kind of explain what Cisco OpenStack Private Cloud is. Um, there's that slide about the interchangeability of terms. So I kind of think of MetaCloud as kind of having two parts. And one part is our distribution of OpenStack that we deliver in a platform as a service. And basically, we take OpenStack, uh, we curate it, we test it, and then we add some extra features in there. And I'd like to say that MetaCloud is really uh, a platform that is delivered uh, to IT teams, but really for developers. So if we, we have some extra features and functionality that are really geared towards the operators to give them extra visibility and control uh, within their cloud infrastructure. We do that on an extensibility model. So everything we do uses OpenStack APIs, but we have some extra features uh, for operators to be able to troubleshoot applications and kind of oversee the health of their cloud as a whole. The other part of that is what we call our advanced operational support. So this is the as a service part. And the best way to explain this, I've found, is to actually show some of the tickets that we generate. So here's an example of a ticket where a hypervisor had a critical memory error. And so not only did we, we have about 10,000 checks happening per minute across all of our customers' availability zones, but we'll say, hey, you know, your hypervisor you know, might be oversubscribed or there's an error. Uh, we're going to go ahead and move the VMs for you. And we work with our customers to set up these processes and actually not only let them know there's a problem, but resolve the problem for them. And our operators love this, and our developers probably don't even know that it happens, uh, but it's really part of the magic behind what we do. Here's another example where we did an upgrade. And so we basically said, hey, we've got some upgrades for you. Uh, there might be an interruption of orchestration, but we're not going to have any issues on the running instances. If you want us to reschedule, let us know. And so we actually do in-place upgrades in addition to all the patching and all the ro remote operations and engineering. And we release about every six to eight weeks. So every six to eight weeks, we're taking that OpenStack code, we're testing it, we're making sure it's absolutely ready for production use, and then we go ahead and roll that into the environment. So uh, Paris, we had Tapjoy on stage, and uh, that was a, a big use case uh, story that was covered by the super user organization. Uh, if you haven't seen that, check it out. It's a big data workload that was uh, highly publicized. GigaOM covered it and a few other folks. Uh, they're still with us, and they're still growing like crazy. And uh, we expect to, to hear more from Tapjoy at Cisco Live if any of you are going to be there. And now for the fun part. So, I'm really excited to have these panelists. I think their stories couldn't be any more different from each other, and they're kind of all in various stages of, of deployment at this stage. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and let you all introduce yourself. Rob, we'll start with you. I'm Rob Lindros. I work for Sprint, a uh, telecom design engineer in SME. Uh, I'm Ilan Rabinovich. I work with Uyala. Um, I manage our infrastructure and site, site reliability engineering teams. Uh, Mittal Patel, I manage the technical operations at Shutterfly. Rafi Kardayan, uh, I was CTO at MetaCloud uh, before coming in and, and now basically handling the, the same role for Cisco. So I run engineering and operations. Awesome. And so let's start with our first question, uh, which is probably the most obvious. What are you doing with Cisco OpenStack Private Cloud? I guess I'll go first. Um, 
So uh, Shutterfly has a, a brand called thislife.com that's hosted in AWS, and um, we were seeing very uh, ever-increasing OpEx costs that our business really wanted to control. So uh, we proposed an internal cloud, which would allow us to kind of use our existing data center architecture that, that we've invested heavily in, um, and allow engineering to basically move the AWS footprint in-house um, and then in the long term, over three or five years, we we're hoping that we could still utilize public cloud um, as a burst option for our, our seasonal workload. Um, so yeah, I mean, currently we just finished uh, installing our kind of proof of concept. Uh, we're moving over some of the dev and test environments that we have in AWS to, to kind of uh, do a, a validation that you know this, the cloud's actually going to work. Um, and then uh, early next year, we're hoping to move uh, the bulk of our AWS footprint in-house. And, and you, if I remember correctly, you want to basically put a Heroku style type architecture on top, correct? That's uh, that's our long term goal. I mean, there's a lot of different options out there. That's that's kind of a very uh, uh, very fluid uh, area right now. Um, so you know, we're we're looking at Mesos and and uh, Cloud Foundry and, and a lot of these different vendors that are building on top of OpenStack to to kind of get us to that level where developers can just turn up environments uh, on demand as needed to, to pipeline the uh, streamline the workflow. Um, we haven't really made a decision on which route we want to go yet, but having the you know, OpenStack in-house kind of gives us the flexibility to, to move in whatever direction we want. And how did you start with OpenStack? Like, what was the uh, initial driver? Uh, it's, it's really just research and, and figuring out if we want to go VMware or OpenStack. Uh, those are kind of the two big options. Uh, we have a VMware footprint in-house, and, and we know how much that costs. Um, so that immediately kind of uh, shied us away from that, that uh, route. And so uh, OpenStack just seemed to have the, the biggest community and the, the most traction. And so we, we just went that direction pretty early on. Um, it wasn't too difficult a decision. Um, that was earlier last year, I would say, that we kind of decided to do that. And did you install it yourselves and go that route? We tried, yeah. <laughs> uh, my team's pretty small and we're responsible for a lot of other things. And so we weren't given a lot of uh, uh, resources to try and you know, play around with it. Um, so, uh, you know, we tried uh, Canonical, Red Hat, uh, some of the other uh, cloud uh, options out there, and um, we just did not have the time to really maintain it and manage it ourselves. And, and that's why uh, uh, Meta Cloud was, was a very attractive option for us. Awesome. How about you, Elon? Uh, yeah. So we run uh, we run OpenStack for a couple different workloads um, in our in our data centers, uh, both uh, both here in the U.S. as well as uh, down in Australia. Uh, and it's primarily we're using it to power a lot of our uh, internal sort of uh, back-end systems for our, uh, for our analytics platforms. Uh, Uyala does end-to-end uh, -end video solutions, everything from the delivering the video that you watch when you're, you're probably on any of your favorite websites, uh, all the way to the other end of helping people monetize it and actually reporting on how, you know, how many times you click pause and did you watch it all the way through and all of the other interesting uh, analytics that you might want. Uh, and so that... Um, you know, we're using, we, that's where we rely on, on MetaCloud and, and Cisco private, oh, yeah, what have you, to, uh, <laughs> to, to power the, um, you know, to, to, to power a lot of those systems and help us get that automation. Um, we've been in EC, we were, we've been in the cloud, so we've been in EC2 since 2007. Um, our founders won the first startup challenge, so I think at the time you could get an M1 large and an S3 bucket, and that's it. Sort of like any, car, any color you want on that car, as long as it's black. Um, and so for us, uh, as we started to move into our data center a bit more for, um, for some of that cost control, uh, we were we were sort of spoiled by the automation of the API, you know the automation we can do around APIs, uh, something that we couldn't do as well if we were doing the KVM and Zen management ourselves. And so we started to look at OpenStack, and you know similar situation to um, to Mittal. We were a very small team at the time, and we could we found we could invest in you know things like Cassandra and Hadoop and Spark, things that actually helped our application teams. Uh, be successful with the analytics platform, or we could invest in OpenStack, and we think we made the right call in uh, relying on some fine folks at uh, Cisco and MetaCloud. Yes, yeah, Cisco OpenStack Private Cloud. Yeah, COPC. COPC. <laughs> That's shorter. I'll go with that. So uh, you moved from AWS, and you you are doing quite a bit of automation at this point in four availability zones. Uh, yeah. So I mean, I wouldn't say moved. We're still very active in both AWS and in Azure. Um, we're using uh, and we're using OpenStack as well, but yeah, we have uh, four four availability zones today running on uh, on on OpenStack. 
And Rob, uh, you know, obviously Shutterfly, Uyala kind of companies born on the web. Sprint's been around for a while. Tell us what you're doing as much as you can. We are deploying a uh, COPC to availability zone cloud uh, in the core of our network to support uh, messaging modernization. So the next gen version of your text messaging. And has your team or other teams at Sprint, is this their first foray into OpenStack? Uh, we've been playing with it for a while, uh, but nothing in production as of yet. Did you find pains in operating it yourself? Uh, yes, very much so. Uh, you need a certain level of skill, a lot of knowledge, steep learning curve. Um, due to the nature, the size, and the scale of what we're deploying, uh, we needed the skill set immediately and uh, found that Cisco could provide that for us. So one thing that's, that I think is kind of interesting is, you know, in the model that we deliver, it's very much a, a SaaS type offering. And so there, while there are benefits to that, there can also be uh, some downsides. You know, it's, it's not as easy to just have any old feature out of OpenStack right. added at any time. Rafi, how are we handling that? So this is something we've had to, to consider uh, over many years of running MetaCloud. So we've had uh, deployments that were launched back in 2012 at this point. Um, and there are environments that have been up and running since that point in time. And of course, every six months, there's a new OpenStack release. I think anyone who's been accustomed to and familiar with OpenStack over the years knows that features are introduced at a rapid pace, but they're also at varying levels of maturity. Uh, so we're continuously evaluating the state of those features and making a, an assessment. And we go one of two directions. If there's a gap, we aim to fill that gap with what our clients need, or we'll defer introducing that functionality into a later point in time. So the point is, we're, you know, we're uh, providing a layer of filtering to say, this is suitable, this is consumable and usable by our customers before just making it available to them and incurring, let's just say, technical debt on their behalf. So where have you found the most challenges in terms of projects that are maybe not ready for prime time in your eyes? So I, it's probably anyone who's, you know, who's worked with us for a while knows that we've taken a pretty conservative stance on networking. Uh, so we're just now making the transition, for example, from Nova Network to Neutron. And it's interesting because the conversation as we have it in a lot of ways starts off with not I need features X or Y on network, on my network, but I need Neutron. And as we distill down what the actual needs are, we can fill them with a more tried and true Nova network. Now we're reaching the limits and extents of where we can take Nova network, but that strategy for us uh, is, is somewhat reflective of the approach that we've taken in general with all of our features, which is we're not going to put our clients at risk. We're going to favor stability uh, and reliability over features because it would have been really easy for us to say, put Neutron out there before it was ready and subject our clients to a lot of pain. So we're incorporating it now. We feel it's ready now and we feel that we've got the right tools be able to incorporate it and integrate it into our product in a way uh, that our clients can feel comfortable with the same level of assurance we've been able to provide to date. Which one of you, are, which of you are using VMware currently? Uh, using, using a little bit? Well, yeah. Have you found that transition between, maybe it's not even a transition, but you know, how hard is it to get folks who are you know, well-versed in VMware to make that transition to start thinking in a more cloudy way? It's certainly been a challenge. It really has. It's just a different way to operate. Um, uh, having the tools and the ability to automate and orchestrate uh, are certainly much better. Um, certainly you can buy tools from VMware, but uh, there's certainly a price tag for that. What about you, Mattel? Um, we haven't really tried to transition. We, we kind of took a dual, dual strategy where we'll have both available for our legacy code base, which really isn't um, possible to kind of re-engineer to make it uh, you know, cloud ready. Uh, we tend to just throw it on VMware because they, it uh, allows for kind of a more traditional data center, but just that flexibility to operations to, to uh, move stuff around and, and have uh, uh, high reliability. Um, and we're making OpenStack available. And, and the direction we're going is to have OpenStack be the, the primary cloud um, and make sure engineering kind of writes to that. And engineering's 
on board, obviously, they want to be able to use you know self-service on demand and automated provisioning, and um, it just they don't have the uh, resources to go back and rewrite all the old code. So um, uh, that's kind of the direction we're taking. We're we're kind of treating them as separate clouds um, and trying to find uh, areas where we can maybe bridge uh, networking, for example, um, and, and maybe compute and, and see if we can uh, down the road integrate them later on. Seems like, you know, especially for you, Matal and Elon, that your teams have been pretty well versed in AWS for some time. Uh, it's probably a loaded question, but how, how much uh, importance or weight do you put on a consistent set of APIs? Uh, that was that was key to us, actually. We, we have a ton of uh, engineering time re invested in automating AWS, uh, scaling up and down uh, pools and, and automating uh, uh, workflows and, and uh, that kind of thing. So having an EC2 compatible API was important because we didn't want to have to redo all that for a different API. Um, over time, we will definitely start using some of the more native Nova and Neutron APIs because they're more feature rich, but it kind of gave us that, that you know, uh, time frame to, to make that transition without having to immediately invest in it. So you're using the OpenStack APIs for EC2 for some of your workloads? Yeah, I mean, our provisioning and, and release and, and uh, uh, the deployment scripts are all kind of written toward, toward the EC2 API. So uh, with very little offer, we were able to kind of transition to, to work with uh, the OpenStack cloud. And um, obviously, there's some gaps there, but uh, over time, we'll, we'll fix those by uh, migrating to the, the Nova API. What about you, Elon? Um, I mean, it's, it's definitely a nice to have. Um, I think for us, what we ended up doing on a lot of our tools is just extending them uh, you know, extending the libraries we had written around interacting with clouds to cover OpenStack. In some cases, that happens to hit the EC2 APIs. In some cases, that happens to hit the Nova APIs directly. Um, and so most people, as yes, they're developing against uh, OpenStack in our environment, are not developing against the OpenStack APIs. They're developing against a tool we call NProv that happens to talk EC2, Azure, and OpenStack uh, without having to worry about all that in between. And, um, I hope someday like, we'll see things like Chef Provisioning and Terraform take this away from me and I never have to think about it again, but that's, you know, t today we've sort of, we, for us, what we did is we built an abstraction layer for everybody, and so that, you know, would it be nice to have a consistent API everywhere? Yeah, I think at the same time there are things that you worry about in OpenStack that I will never have to worry about in EC2. I, I don't care how much disk is available on hypervisors in EC2 because that's Amazon's problem. In our data center, if we're out of disk and I need to go order another rack from somebody, I need to know that. And so there's going to be different APIs and tools and reports, and I think I'm okay with that. Any thoughts on APIs, Rob? Yes, we will be delivering uh, a product at some point uh, to allow us to make use of those APIs. We have a different need, though. Um, in the carrier world, uh, it's all about availability. Uh, so a lot of the tools that we will be putting in place will be leveraging the APIs for deployment, management, auto scale, things of that nature. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, automation and configuration management. Have you each chosen a tool of choice? And Rafi, this might apply to you on the back end of the platform as well. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've gone through a multitude of different tools. Uh, I, I think you know, many, of, many of the folks here have heard about what we've done on our back end with config <laughs> management. Uh, we use sort of a, a proprietary config management system. And I say proprietary loosely because it's actually open source, but it's something that we've built. But as we've gone along here, we've evaluated a couple of different options. We started looking at SaltStack, we looked at Chef, and we've ultimately landed on Ansible. Um, and we landed on Ansible because of the simplicity that Ansible delivers. So it's not quite as structured, say, as a Chef, um, but for the use case that we're covering in, in effect, centrally managing a network of clouds, uh, we fa found or we knew that nothing out of the box was really gonna suit our needs. So we needed the configuration management tool that was going to be most adaptable um, without having to get too much in the guts uh, of the CMS itself. So we've gone the direction of Ansible. We're actually transitioning our back end over the next couple of months to be completely Ansible managed. Um, we actually use Ansible as well um, for provisioning orchestration. Um, the, the problem is because we have several brands acquired through different uh, Time frames. Uh, some are using Puppet. Some are using Chef. One is still using CF Engine. So um, we w didn't want to take on the task of rewriting all of these 
um, backend. So we made a decision to, to have Ansible be part of the provisioning orchestration layer and then just do a handoff to whatever system the uh, engineering team wants to use for config management. So Chef, And that's pretty it. common too. We're mm -hmm. seeing that quite a bit. Um, yeah, we're, we're uh, big into Chef. We've been using Chef for a number of years now and so um, you know, started off as just a way to manage the plumbing, like you mentioned, you know, get the systems up, make sure that everything from RAID to mail are configured the way you want them configured in all of our different clouds in the same way. Uh, and we're starting to see uh, significant adoption from our uh, application engineering teams to use Chef as well. Um, although the second path that we're seeing a lot of, uh, a lot of uptake on is uh, internally we've built a, you know, you mentioned wanting to go down sort of this Heroku path. Uh, there's, you know, the, the internal version of that at Uyala is something we call Atlantis that we've open sourced that's a, uh, uh, a Docker sort of scheduler and provisioner. Uh, and so the other way that teams are uh, deploying applications and provisioning nodes is via, via Docker, uh, via this Atlantis service. Uh, and that, that also will run on top of, runs on top of OpenStack. So that's just Ubuntu VMs using Chef. And, the, you know, at that point, Docker just gets scheduled on them. So. Have you all made a decision yet, Rob? Well, we, we like Ansible, but I think we're moving down the puppet path at this point. Interesting. <laughs> Such a mix of, of everything. There's lots of good options yeah. now. Yeah. That wasn't always the case. I mean, honestly, if you, as long as you have a system for managing your configuration and, you, and, uh, and you, you know it well and use it well, great. You're better off than somebody that doesn't. And then between that, like that's, after that, it's personal preference, Coke versus yeah. Pepsi, and what does your team need? I, I think that's the important point here, the recognition that everything needs to be automated and that your entire infrastructure should be managed by a CMS is the key point, <coughs> more than the actual tool itself. Because all of the tools largely solve the problems. I mean, there's, there's intricacies in how they're solving them different ways, but by and large, the, uh, getting the organization to embrace and adopt this as the style and method for managing infrastructure is the key. You mentioned containers. So you all are, are using containers in production, Elon? Yeah. You are? We are. And, and Matal, I know you guys are kind of going down the path of just kind of exploring at this point. Um, well, we, we have a couple of small services that um, we are deploying with Docker. Um, they're going to be in production pretty soon. So they're, they're more, uh, you know, just getting our feet wet in terms of uh, using Docker. And um, we're definitely excited to see how Docker becomes or containers become part of uh, OpenStack uh, in terms of being able to use a unified API to, to do a VM and, uh, and a container. Uh, is really great for us because we can give engineering the, either option. Um, right now, we're kind of treating the, the Docker pipeline as a separate uh, entity than the OpenStack um, and a cloud. Rob? No containers as of yet, uh, but I believe it's coming quickly. Excellent. Yeah. So, Matal and Elon, you both are running sort of in a, you've both gone down the hybrid path. You know, you've got some public cloud, you've probably got you know, VMware, other things. How are you connecting all of that? Is it at the application layer? Are you doing it at the network layer? Is it all of the above? Uh, right now for us, it's, it's actually not connected. That's, that's kind of the, the next challenge for us is to figure out uh, how and when to connect the, the clouds. And, um, you know, we may make the decision to not connect them and just keep them as separate, uh, you know, pipelines for, for code and um, services either divided by the, the brand and the engineering team that, that's using it or just in terms of, uh, you know, cost, uh, cost centers, just separating them out that way. Um, for us, the, in general, the goal is to limit the amount of interconnectivity between these things as much as possible. We, treat, we try to treat each of our regions or data centers or what have you as, uh, you know, separate failure domains. So you don't want, you know, if something, ha if another you know, something happens on the East Coast again, you know, Hurricane Sandy or what have you, and maybe there's some issues on, you know, US East One. I don't want that to impact my meta cloud deployment in, in Australia or in, um, you know, or in Sunnyvale. Uh, but that's, you know, at the same time, there's, there's, there's always going to be some need for, there, there is some limited need of, of connectivity. So like, it, say, at the data layer, you know, if you want to watch, people want to be able to watch the same movies in, 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 you know, APAC as they can here in North America, you need to be able to get that data to propagate backwards and forwards. So most of our, most of that happens at the application layer at that sort of, um, at the data replication level. But in general, we try to keep them as separate as possible. And how are you overcoming any sort of latency or perceived latency that, that might occur? Uh, I mean, that's the, so you, you kind of want to work, this is, this is where I think, you know, people use the term cloud native. I don't know that I'm a fan of that term, but that's, I think, really, uh, 
a synonym for writing good software. <laughs> uh, like you're, 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 you're writing your software with the idea that there are, is going to be things like latency and failure introduced there. And so that the VM fails or a network link goes down, you're sort of failing in an open fashion rather than, fail, than, rather than failing in a way that impacts your availability. Um, and so we've, we've taken a lot of that into account as we're building our systems. Um, so one thing that um, I did a couple talks on this in the past few summits, but one thing that is probably evident to everyone is that there is a sort of uh, a lack of cloud expertise, available cloud expertise in the market. So you know, folks are being paid a lot more if they have cloud expertise, and companies certainly are recruiting to try to find good cloud expertise. Are you finding it challenging to to find that kind of expertise, or are you looking kind of at it differently and bringing your existing staff up to speed with, with training and new skills? I believe the answer for Sprint is to train our folks up, ultimately. Um, but that was part of the decision to go with Cisco for the support model there. Um, from a uh, application deployment perspective, we really have a vendor accountability model. Um, so we, we don't grow our own applications in-house. Um, so it's, there's gonna have to be an education with our traditional carrier vendors on, on how to move down this path. Because most of them today are not using any virtualization in any way. It's a, it's a significant challenge. Uh, we may have to put on a workshop for them. <laughs> you know. What about uh, you, Elon? Um, yeah, I think uh, hiring is always a challenge, especially in you know, heart markets like, like the Bay Area. Um, I don't think it's either or, we're, we're trying to do both, and I don't even know that it's like cloud specific. I mean, I think the, the reality is uh, whether it's software, software developers or software developers focused on infrastructure, it's, it's a hot market right now and good talent is, is good talent. Uh, the cloud is something that I think any, any, strong, any strong operations or software person is gonna learn very quickly. Um, I just, it's just a tough market in general. There's, uh, there's not, not, uh, not as many SREs out there as I'd like to see. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I agree with, with Elon here. Um, so, I mean, w one of the reasons we went with MetaCloud is to kind of buy us some time to, to get the folks in-house up to speed on OpenStack and, and get them ramped up so that they take a much more hands-on approach to, uh, you know, upcoming iterations of our, of our cloud and, and figuring out exactly the, the best route to go. Um, at the same time, we're you know obviously looking around for for a new headcount, and, and it is very difficult in the Bay Area. Uh, uh, people that do know the cloud uh, get snatched up pretty quickly, um, so it, it becomes difficult unless we can make the case and, and sell the company to them as an interesting place to work. What about you, Rafi? I know you've got a lot of recs open. We have a stampede <laughs> of OpenStack talent who just wants to get in the door at Metacroft. No. Um, <laughs> The, the truth is a lot of the uh, OpenStack expertise or a lot of what goes into operating environments such as an OpenStack cloud is experience such as large scale distributed infrastructure and computing. So is there a lot of OpenStack talent out there and available to come in and on day one necessarily contribute to OpenStack? Not necessarily. But over the years, of course, we, as we've grown our team, uh, we've onboarded folks. We obviously have the process down in, in how to incorporate them and grow the team uh, as needed. A lot of us have come from shops who have run uh, and have run large distributed uh, infrastructure. So we've built large teams and this is much take two or take three for us utilizing a different application and platform. So it's something we're adept in and we've continued to uh, prove ourselves as being able to, to grow and scale the team over the last couple of years. Anything in your way that you think will prevent you from moving as fast as you want to? Um, so there's a lot of moving parts. Uh, I, think, uh, I, I think the twists and turns the technology will take and the industry will take will, uh, will gate some of how quickly we can move. We're having to keep ourselves uh, amenable and uh, adaptable so that we can turn. So for example, the recent interest and in shift towards containers, right? That could change in six months. So a lot is still being defined because organizations are still working themselves to understand what's the, what's the hype and what's the, uh, what, what are the real solutions and what are the tools to be incorporated um, that make sense that actually provide value. So uh, I think as the path becomes clear as to what organizations and companies want, we'll be able to focus our um, attention in a couple of distinct areas as opposed to being a little bit wider as we have to be today. 
What advice do you all have for other OpenStack adopters? Would be OpenStack adopters. Um, I don't know. We're still learning ourselves. I don't know if I'm qualified <laughs> to give advice at this point. Um, I, it's tough to say on this panel, but uh, look at all your options. Um, we, we chose MetaCloud for, for obvious reasons, and um, there are definitely other uh, vendors out there, and it's a quick moving market. So, um, you know, you got to stay on top of all the new uh, stuff coming out. And even though, you know, we're a few uh, versions behind of, of Kilo, uh, we definitely want to pay attention to what's coming up so that we can, you know, give you guys feedback to, to, to say, you know, we're really interested in this feature and, and uh, make sure you guys make it part of your uh, product roadmap. Do you ever see members of your team actually contributing back to OpenStack in any way or? Uh, not yet. Uh, maybe soon. There's some out there, so maybe they'll take the hint. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, we're like I said, we're 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 pretty new to it, so I think as as we get more and more experience with it, we'll we'll definitely uh, start uh, doing that. What about you, Elon? What advice? Can um, you folks? I'd, yeah, I'd say. Uh, I mean, you really want to make sure that you're you start interacting with it early as an actual cloud and not effectively another VMware. Like the the web the web portal is cool. Get to the point where you're automating against the APIs very quickly. Um, I think, and you know, there's also just the general advice I give to anybody going into the cloud and you know working with distributed systems is architect for that failure that we were talking about earlier. Um, you know, I think when in the first meeting when we were talking with with Rafi and, and some of his colleagues at Viala, they're like, well, how much do you care about uh, um, about making sure that you know the storage is you know the storage is reliable and that if a VM you know if an individual VM dies that we need to recover it. And on 90 percent of the time, I'd rather it just die and not have to worry about and spin up another one. I know the support guys in the back of the room are grinning because they've had to deal with me at times, but uh, but but yeah, I mean that's that's the thing is architect for that day. Be ready for any individual VM to die, um, but also be you know but use those API that, those APIs and that automation to replace them as fast as you can. Well, uh, I'd say do your homework, research, read, spend time analyzing. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of options out there, a lot of different configurations. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's really and Rob, I mean, obviously, Sprint is a very large company. Mm -hmm. You know, you probably use all kinds of different technologies. You yeah. know, how are you going to implement cloud without bringing your old sort of processes of requesting tickets and having to go through the approval process and, and do all that? I'd say we're dragging Sprint, kicking and screaming. Yeah. It, yeah, it, it's a challenge. It really is. I mean, we're a traditional old school telco. And, uh, Folks are ready, they're excited about what this means, um, but it has its challenges. I mean, some processes have to be redefined. Um, I'm not quite sure that they're ready to change their organizations yet, but uh, uh, we're trying to fit new technology and process into a, a, a legacy world. Right? Sure. Yeah. What percentage of, of moving to cloud do you think is cultural versus technology? I'd, say probably 90% cultural. Um, the technology's there. I mean, it's, it's, it's easy to use, it's easy to run, um, but it's, it's all about the organization and how you're structured. That's really where all your challenges come from. Do you agree with that, Elon? Um, I think it depends on what you mean moving to cloud. Like, I, I know lots of organizations that they just take their enterprise apps, the, you know, the, the same Oracle-based whatever it was that they ran in their data center and they try to run it in EC2 and they say, Oh look, EC2 is not reliable, but 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 I'm done. I'm in the cloud, uh, or you know, OpenStack or what have you. Um, you know, that's that's not the hard part. Like getting your stuff up and running is not is not it. It's getting it. Like, there's all these other benefits of cloud that people talk about, whether it's the self-service provisioning or the fact that you're you're auto scaling or all these other pieces. I think that's the that's sort of the culture um, slash engineering part. You want to get to the point where you're um, that's what your teams are building for, rather than just you know, let me pick up this thing and move it into a new data center. Like that doesn't. That, that, that's, not, that's not what I would call the cloud, even if it's not running in your four walls. What about you, Mattel? Um, yeah, I think it's definitely more of a cultural um, challenge than technology, um, especially for an established company that, that's used to doing business uh, with you know, the yearly capex cycles and capacity planning and that kind of model. Um, it's, it's tough to get business and other groups to kind of buy in on a uh, more OpEx-based model where you're, you know, uh, relying on external vendors to kind of uh, provide the capacity. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and it's also, uh, I mean, our, our company is not as old as, as Sprint and not as big, but we also have similar challenges where 
um, we have uh, established processes and it takes a lot of effort to try and um, change those. What about you, Rafi? So I think I, I'm going to echo a lot of what's been said and, and I do think it's largely cultural. Uh, I'll make the distinction here and say that there's two parts to it. There's IaaS in the context that we're talking about and there's cloud. IaaS is a technology and an approach to technology. <coughs> cloud is a mindset. And IaaS has limited value and usefulness if you're not also willing to embrace the methodologies and the line of thinking that you have with cloud. Um, and we see this pretty frequently. Different organizations are at li different points in embracing this shift. Some can more readily embrace it because they're, they're able to in invest in engineering resources or they're building new applications. Others, it's a little harder um, because they've got more proliferation of legacy apps. So we get a pretty good indicator of what, where an organization is when we start initially interfacing um, by the type of questions that are generally asked. There can be questions along the spectrum of, I'm translating my enterprise, my legacy enterprise infrastructure to try to run on OpenStack, and there's benefit to doing that. Um, versus a lot of what Alan is talking about, which is from the ground up, from day one, the application was born and raised on EC2. So you can see that, and I think there's a middle ground. Um, our goal is really to facilitate and help ease that transition by having a reasonable set of features present in our platform without covering everything that you would need to encompass for enterprise. To get people started, to help usher them to the point where they can facilitate more, more traditional or what we'll call cloud uh, mindsets and workloads. And it's interesting, I think in a lot of the customer conversations I've been in, you can, you can tell very quickly where that mindset is, especially if they start talking about hardware right. first. Right. And, and I think that's a, a good point. You know, Cisco OpenStack Private Cloud, even though we're, we're part of Cisco, we are hardware agnostic. We like to see Cisco preferred, uh, just because it makes everyone's life easier on our team, right? And there's other benefits that come, faster delivery times, other things, but does the hardware matter? at this point? For us right now, so parts of the hardware do matter, but we're still, for the most part, we're non-prescriptive. Um, so any x86 hardware, UCS has, of course, benefits, but still, any, any x86 hardware. And that'll continue to be the case, because there's no expectation that we'll go into a client, and let's just say, from this point in time, they decide we're buying UCS from now on. Well, there's probably still an investment in some other uh, hardware from some other vendor that would likely be incorporated into the cloud environment. So we know we need to embrace that. That's not something we plan to change. So completely uh, hardware agnostic today. Does the hardware matter, Mattel? Uh, it matters when it costs more, I guess. <laughs> uh, we, I mean, we run Dell. I mean, that's, that's just the route we've chosen over the years. And, and we're not married to Dell. It's just every year we kind of decide and, and do the, the math. and they always come out a little bit cheaper, so we always just go to them. And with OpenStack, it matters even less. Um, it doesn't matter where your instance is running. What about you, Elon? Um, I think the hardware, it matters that the hardware is good, whatever, whatever your definition of good is and that it meets your needs. It matters that it's not um, horribly failure prone and that you're dealing with dead drives every week. Um, but other than that, like, we're, I mean, we're a multi, I mean, some, some of what uh, Atal was saying, we're, we're, um, you know, we're a multi-hardware multi-hardware vendor shop. I mean, lately we've been drinking a lot of the Hive Kool-Aid and buying a lot of the OCP type gear. Um, but before that, uh, we've had HP and Dell both in house, and you know that those, all three of those vendors are in our in our OpenStack environments. So, um, what about you, Rob? Well, previously hardware was everything. Um, mm -hmm. a, a lot of different options. Uh, what we deploy in our network. Um, for our new solution here, this is all going to be Cisco UCS based. Yeah, and the one thing I'll add to that, again, to, to uh, build on a launch point here, is that, you know, what we see in a lot of ways is there was a transition for a while. Everyone was, you know, banging the drum of, of white box until they started to encounter a higher rate of failures than even they were comfortable with. Yeah. So the reliability, as, as much as it's been de-emphasized, it doesn't mean that it's not an issue at all because yeah. that cost still continues to play a factor. A human's got to go replace those drives, whether exactly. it's you or the HP repair guy or the right. UCS repair guy. Somebody's got to deal with that. And so you want to, you want, you're hoping for reliable hardware there. Mm -hmm. um, 
I mean, that being said, I think the, the brand name hardware is the, is the place where we've seen more failures than the white box hardware, so. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'm gonna take the audience questions here after this next question. So if you have any burning questions that you absolutely want to ask, don't be shy. I, we've got someone back here. Gary, you have a microphone for these folks? We actually have one right up there. Awesome. So while we're getting that mic ready, I'm gonna ask you a question, Rafi. Uh, we, we recently announced sort of a, a bundle, it's a partner bundle that has some very prescriptive hardware from Cisco. Yep. Um, can you tell us about sort of that bundle and what you think it will help us achieve? Yeah, so the idea is, and I don't know that we've got an uh, official name for it, Alan was uh, a key part of it, he's sitting up here in the front row. Uh, we have a, a hardware bundle that's, that's coming out that basically helps with, with getting up and running uh, utilizing uh, our platform. It basically gives you uh, what you need to get going with our controllers. And our controllers are x86 boxes with a particular hardware spec. Uh, it gives you the networking equipment. So you basically got the foundational components you need to get up and running with your first availability <coughs> zone. And as you need more, you can roll in additional uh, stacks of this hardware. The unofficial name uh, we've been giving it is sort of a play off of the Cisco FlexPod and called Metapod, very uh, originally. Um, but it'll probably have a, a more formal name as, as we get along. But it's, it's seen, or the intent is to be an, an accelerator and to build on our model, which is ease of use and ease of consumption of OpenStack, to apply that all the way down to the hardware. And there will be some gains in, in terms of SDN capabilities and other things that come along. There with will that. be. We're doing integration against uh, some Cisco hardware to get some accelerated benefits, such as integration against the Cisco ASRs to do uh, L3 integration in Neutron. Uh, there were some articles that Cisco published about the work that we've been doing in that space. But it takes a very robust Neutron L3 agent, which has been to date. Uh, accelerated or placed on x86 hardware and moves it to tried and true uh, ASR routers, which will give us uh, not only the, the general level of resilience, but failover and much higher throughput than you would otherwise be able to achieve on x86 hardware. And it's ACI ready so that as That's that right. rolls out? So uh, the bundle itself, the, the Metapod bundle is based on Nexus 9K uh, infrastructure. So. Uh, all of the, the 9Ks are ACI ready. So at the point where organizations, if the decision's made that yes, I want ACI, the switching infrastructure is already in place. The idea will be to retrofit an APIC controller and uh, make a transition in terms of the, the platform to use the ACI plugins. And yeah, well, uh, it should, I can't say how disruptive or, or seamless it will be, but the idea is it certainly won't be a greenfield hardware deployment to make that transition. You can utilize the existing investment that's made. We had a question in the back. How important is it that the OpenStack distribution is certified on the hardware for support and yeah, troubleshooting between both the software and the hardware vendor? How important is that? So for us, it's obviously important to do hardware level integration testing. A lot of folks focus on the OpenStack part. And I, I like to make the distinction that OpenStack is a sliver of a large stack of software. Uh, if you consider one of the key components of that stack, it's the Linux kernel. And it is still vitally critical to be able to do testing against the hardware that you're running over top of so that the Linux kernel, for example, that's incorporated in the distro that you're shipping is reliable and can present all the features, for example, that need to be consumed up stack or up uh, the layers of the technology platform into OpenStack. So for example, how reliable is the VXLAN implementation in the kernel that you're shipping? Because we incorporate VXLAN uh, into our platform. So the end-to-end -end validation is what's important. It's not just the Python bits. Elon, you look like you had a comment about that. No, I just I think it makes sense. I mean, that's this is something where whenever we we're bringing up a new rack, I and mean, we've definitely had these conversations with uh, you know with the Cisco team around uh, you know what what should we be looking at, and and yeah, I mean that's the places where we've seen you know where, where we've run into I guess more painful experiences at times. I mean, in general, it's been it's been great, but where we run into issues at times is like oh the 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 that piece of hardware with that driver on that kernel 
they're not they're not making friends and they're not going to get along right. for a while and that's that's where you spend some time troubleshooting things i mean the, the open stack bits i mean these guys these guys have got it down solid yeah i mean to, to sort of provide an example uh in, in, in the room here we've seen better reliability with the driver interaction at the linux level on network interfaces with intel cards rather than broadcom cards so that's one example of where it matters and some of that has less to do, or a lot of that has less to do with what we're doing in particular at MetaCloud and our platform versus the maturity of that driver set in the general community. So we can make those recommendations because we're able to, we have visibility across a network of clouds, all of whom are utilizing the hardware in largely the same ways, using, you know, it's being used for an IaaS platform. So we can, we can provide those recommendations as well in addition to, uh, delivering a, a solid framework and all the components that are necessary for that. Okay. Hi. So one of the tussles that we have when you go from a self-managed infrastructure to a managed service like you're providing is the tussle between how much control you want and how much you are letting go to, for each of you as a customer to, towards MetaCloud. So how did you kind of balance that and if you can comment a few your own experiences about that? Um, so, yeah, that was obviously a big question for us when we decided to, to go to MetaCloud. Um, we toyed with a few other vendors, uh, uh, and um, the, the, main, the main factors for us in terms of control are, are visibility into the, the stack so we can make decisions about capacity planning and you know, uptime reliability. Um, and I think MetaCloud uh, focused on that a little bit more than, than the other vendors, so it made the decision a little bit easier. Uh, obviously, we don't want to give up control, but at the same time, we don't want to be in the business of, of you know, maintaining an OpenStack cloud. Uh, we'd rather uh, work on our application and work with engineering and, and work on that level. Um, so it, it's a fine balance, and, and I think as long as we have visibility and, and we can uh, get enough information out of the, the cloud to, to make decisions, um, that, that was enough for us to, to kind of make the, the jump in. For us, we wanted input on the design of how it was built. Um, and there are some pieces that we still manage ourselves. So for example, the underlying network that our clusters are built on, um, in most cases, we're managing that. Uh, it wasn't, there wasn't so much of a control thing. It was just, we'd, let's have a discussion and build something together rather than a black box that we don't understand how it works. Um, and yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, we, I mean, the thing that's interesting to us is the stuff that our customers use, not necessarily all of the hardware bits underneath it or the OpenStack bits underneath it. And that's, that's where we wanted to focus. If we wanted to focus on OpenStack, that's, that's where we would be. So. Well? Well, as I mentioned, with Sprint, we kind of have a vendor accountability model. Uh, so this kind of fell right in. Uh, very easy, uh, very similar, though we are uh, managing our network itself underneath. Um, uh, we're in the business of the network, right? So, um, but uh, yeah, moving to Cisco with this was, was pretty easy for us. <clears throat> I heard that uh, cost was a big reason for bringing stuff out of Amazon or public clouds to, to your private OpenStack cloud. Um, additionally, have you been able to realize any optimized performance of your applications in designing your private cloud over public cloud consumption? Is it measurable? And part two, um, although acceptable, what, what do you miss or any functions you you miss in, in using Amazon APIs or, or plugs that you don't have? Um, so we're still kind of moving test environments over. Um, so we don't really have final numbers, but I mean, our projections are, are you know, 15, 20% uh, month over month, uh, mainly because we have a much cheaper uh, cost uh, for power and, and space than we're paying Amazon. Um, it, it's tough to compete with AWS um, in spot pricing. Um, they have that kind of nailed down. Um, where it makes a lot more sense for us is uh, on static workloads, databases, uh, Elasticsearch, that kind of uh, uh, architecture that requires provisioned IOPS and uh, reserved uh, instances. Um, that's where we will definitely get the, the most savings. So the stack we have in AWS is kind of half and half. Uh, our dynamic workers are uh, all spot, and we would actually be uh, uh, um, paying more for the equivalent hardware and internally, but that is more than offset by the cost uh, for provisioned IOPS and uh, uh, reserved instances for databases. So, you know, we, we made the case to business that, um, you know, initial investment up front, uh, 
this is specifically the Shutterfly, but uh, maybe other companies as well, but they, they much prefer spending CapEx and OpEx. So um, that actually was an easy sell for us in terms of we can you know, buy all the hardware and, and we don't have to worry about month over month costs uh, varying that much. Um, yeah, I think uh, for us the big thing was actually that, that performance piece that you speak of. Uh, we were, uh, the, the, the initial move for us into, our, in, into growing our data center with, in, with OpenStack was uh, um, cost for you know, IO operations. Like we could get the IO, op the IO operations that we wanted in EC2, we just had to get more instances or use, you know, provision IOPS didn't exist at the time. <coughs> Uh, you know, use instance types that didn't make sense in terms of the ratio of CPU and memory to I/O performance. Uh, and so, what we were able to do with in our own data centers was kind of create the instance types that really met our needs for for those high I/O operations. Um, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, in terms of cost, like you're optimizing for capex versus opex, and depending on where where you are in your organization's life cycle, maybe you want one or the other. Um, what do I miss? Uh, I miss not having to worry about whether there's not enough hardware in the four walls. <laughs> like it's, I mean, it, yeah. it doesn't, I mean, we usually, we have, we plan pretty far out and usually we've got a, you know, we've got a, we've got another rack coming long before it's really an issue. But sometimes that's not the case. And you get to the point where you used up all the rack space in your building. It's like, well, there's no, there's no ferry that like brings you the new <laughs> rack and it just shows up overnight. You don't have to think about it. Somebody has to go place that order and you have to plan for it in advance. And I, I miss that elastic, elasticity, but then again, it's, I can't miss it that much. I'm still in EC2 and I'm still in Azure. Like I've got other places to do some of this work. It's just, you know, maybe not in the place where I want it to be. One point to add to that: Amazon's done a really good job of getting the industry to focus on instance pricing. Um, if you, and this is a common point, the instance pricing has, of course, been reduced, but it's not commensurate with compute capabilities. But let's not even focus on that part. Let's use one example, and Alon actually alluded to it with IOPS. IOPS, transit, these are two of the areas that Amazon makes actually a lot of their money. Consider this, you put an SSD in one of your systems, what are you going to get? Conservatively, 20, 30, it's actually more in the, in the realm of 50 to 80,000 IOPS. Go and provision 50 or 80,000 IOPS in Amazon and look at what that'll cost you. And that's really the area to, to focus the attention on rather than how much is a compute instance because those prices are intended to attract folks in and get them to start consuming Amazon so that they can make money in the other, other areas. I'm afraid we're gonna have to wrap up. We have another session ready to go, but we're gonna have a drawing for the next iPad mini. So before we give everybody a hand, if you wanna hand in your cards, we'll be doing a drawing. Where are my sales guys? Sales, they were in the back. There's one back there. We do have a, a really awesome pricing calculator. So if, you're, if you wanna see where that price break is for you, if it costs the driver, our sales guys can absolutely help you with that. And thank you all for attending. And thank you to my panelists. You guys are great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.